Okay, my name is Ami Osei from Pong. I come to you live every Monday and Thursday. Monday, I do a relationship show, so I'll, I don't want you to get divorced, and I don't want you to raise up, kind of screw up kids. And on Thursday, I do a more politics show, and this time I'm going to do kind of politics, political philosophy put together. And I'm going to talk about nature in a way, and categories nature, and, and, and how we think about nature, and how the way we think about nature uh, it infects how we think about politics, and some pretty good criticism about that. And let's just start out with Judith Butler. If you don't know, if you talk about Judith Butler in any kind of feminist department in the United States, I th you get a lot of talk about performativity and how gender is performance and all of that. And, but that's like, I think that's the least interesting part of her insight, although it's probably the easiest to take up, but it's also the more superficial aspect of what she offers. Um, I actually think the more penetrating insight goes right down to what she talks about in, in gender trouble insofar as what we think of as sex um, and what we think of as gender. The traditional narrative is that sex is natural and gender is how sex is taken up in our society. But really that's kind of, that's not really empirically true and it's, 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 logically dicey insofar as what we think of as sex differences are themselves a product of the values of gender. So gender then, so we have gender, where we, we just have gender, and then that's worked out politically to have a story about sex as being natural. And you could say like, no, sex is absolutely natural. Um, it's, just, it's just a fact of nature everywhere you see it. And I'm like, well, Maybe, maybe, but I'm not going to have, in nature, women and men just have sex. I mean, like, like, like males and females just have sex, and males have sex with, like, a dog will have sex with a leg. Like, it's not really, it's not really that much of an intellectual thing. Whereas with me, like, I'm not going to have, there's only a very, very, very small percentage of women that I am interested in having sex with and would have sex with without it being like forcibly on me. <laughs> so it's not as if men, men and women have sex naturally and that's just how it works. I'm just like, well, because I don't have sex with like women. I wouldn't want to have sex with women. Insofar as I desire women, it's very, it's very one, socially conditioned. Two, we're talking about a small, small, small. And as I get older and, you know, I'm married now, I don't even want to have sex with like, women in general <laughs> I, I don't i don't uh I, I like it would have to like i said it would have to be it would have to be forced so this idea that it's just natural for you know men and women to pair up um sexually as a as a fact of nature is a little bit dubious because you know and then i look back at my earlier years where i was more sexually adventurous and a lot of that was insecurity so it wasn't really about the sex of men and women. It was just like, I don't know, could I get, <laughs> you know, blank and blank women to be interested in me in that way. So it's never been non-normative. Like sexual, attractive, sexual attraction has never been non-normative or gender specific. It was always kind of a narrow, it was more narrow than that. And it was because it was always socially inflected. So we talk about sex differences as if they're natural, but really we're talking about lots of bodies and like that are run through class, sex, and race, and all of these other dynamics. And then out of that, there's a small subsection of people who I would really appreciate if they reach for my fly. So that's <laughs> and that's not women in general, because <laughs> most women, if they reach for my belt, I would like not be very happy with at all, right? And I would have never been very happy with at all, right? So what we talk about in terms of sexual desire and natural sex is always already kind of socially uh, inflected. So, what, so her argument is that what we think of as nature, the hard sex binary, what we think of as natural is a product of a political project. And we'll go into that political project uh, in a moment. But I want to circle back to Hegel, because I think she gets, she wrote her dissertation on Hegel, and, and I, think, I think a lot of 
feminist scholars who study Butler even don't study enough Hegel. So they miss both Butler and Hegel in a way that I find un unappealing. But I think the same thing about people who study Arendt. And I know people who study, like I was one of those guys who studied Arendt, and I was like, wow, Arendt is such a powerful thinker. Then I studied Hegel, and I was like, oh, well, this is where she gets the best stuff from, and it's like an almost a serious version of, of Hegel. So now let's talk a little bit about Hegel and Hegel's critique of natural law, because he says the same thing about natural law. Natural law is kind of the contract, social contract theorists you read in your undergraduate and some in your advanced high schools, the Locke's, the Hobbes, the Rousseau's, the Kant's, and they say that people are independent and isolable entities. They are just like, they are, people are people independent of other people. And then they happen to get together to protect each other from each other or to get more stuff. They decide to get more stuff, but it's all voluntary. It all should be a voluntary uh, arrangement because uh, Hume also will, will, will go under this, um, under this category. It should all be a voluntary arrangement because persons are ultimately individual um, prior to contact with other persons. They make sense as individuals. Now, the only way you would think that is if you have a whole lot of anti, in, like, <laughs> it's, it's ironic, you have a whole lot of anti-empirical like values doing work because we, we, we have belly buttons. Like no person is never not a person. Humans as individuals die on the vine. They die of exposure, right? So you always have someone relating to you as a person, taking responsibility for you. And as you get older, you taking responsibility for other people. And like, and, and the struggle for humans is trying to figure out how to accommodate this mutual dependence that, may, that allows us to be people in a way that is uh, just and not oppressive, right? So this idea that initially, originally, naturally, we're all independent is never, like, is not true and is a useful fiction. And when I say it's a useful fiction, well, then it makes all political and social rules to secure equality and decision-making power over public goods and the distribution of goods and resources in society. It makes those all contingent because there, there's nothing about the fact of who we are as people that ties us to having to abide to these rules or make sure that other people have to abide by these rules in a way that secures our equality amongst persons, right? So if it's just a, um, if it's just a matter of my opinion or judgment that I should join this community, then it could be just a matter of my opinion or judgment that I should leave any sort of community uh, that I join with because I am, as a person, completely sufficient without community engagement. Um, so I don't have to think about community as a, a part of what it is to be a person. And if you don't have to think of community as a part of what it is to be a person, well, then you could treat community poorly. And you could be OK with other people in the community being treated poorly by the community, and definitely not as equals, right? So you also have a hard time accounting for why people should participate in community institutions or hold themselves accountable to community institutions. Why everyone can't be, this is why everyone can't and shouldn't be a libertarian. Right, because community institutions are already late. They're not a constitutive factor of what it is to be a person. They're something that people who are already people enter into when actually they're constitutive factors of what it is to be a person. Right, but you know, this is, and we get this wrong, and I'm talking about this in a pretty much a book I'm writing um, about when we get this wrong, we have a hard time accounting for why marriages should stay together and why uh, families should actually understand their freedom in being with each other and not being able to just jettison each other. Um, so there's a little bit at stake in this critique of natural law. There's a little bit of, of um, at stake in this very particular understanding of nature that says people are people prior to entering into relationships with other people. That means all relationships with other people take the form of a contract. And contracts can be opted into and opted out of, to, out of with impunity. 
without jeopardizing the moral status of the persons involved. Right? So we need to understand that that's a very particular ideology of nature that then does political work. So if we had presume any sort of contract theory, when we do our polit and with that notion of the state of nature that na people are naturally abstract individuals, then any sort of politics we do in society is already going to be imbued with a quality of libertarianism that denies the fundamentality of interpersonal relationships to personhood. And there's a lot at stake in that. And this is why teaching kids contract theory, Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau in high school and college without, and, uh, and teaching kids that kind of natural law um, understanding of what it is to be a person and what it is to be a person who then enters into relationships with other people actually sets people up to, one, be libertarians, two, to like, be bad at relationships. And it sets people up for a culture of like divorces and bad families, and the assumption that you know children raise themselves because they're naturally people, and adults just have to like kind of feed them. So all of these assumptions, and this is what Hegel talks about, you know, 200 years ago, he says all of these assumptions that go along with natural law theory have a bring in a, a rather thick notion of personhood into. Um, into the political sphere, and now we're just debating within this rather thick notion of personhood, which isn't great. And so now let's circle back to Judith Butler, Judith Butler, with respect to the natural presumption of the gender binary as being particularly relevant and something that cannot be, whose relevance cannot be denied when we talk about gender. And maybe that binary itself is a problem. Because, let's be honest, if sex is natural and sex is primal and, and all women want to have sex with, are made to have sex with, and women are made to have sex with men and men are made to have sex with women, why is it the case that, like, I've never desired women in general? <laughs> like, people don't desire people in general. They desire pe particular people. So I've desired particular kinds of women. And that's often a part of, like, their ethical and intellectual character has, has been a very big part of my desiring for them. So it's not as if women have that much in common with other women, even with respect to being desired by men. Um, so to lump them all in a category and say these are basic categories, they don't have that much in common because they're not desired by the same men, they're not desired by the same women for the same reasons, or, or like naturally, for no reason at all. <laughs> like they, they aren't desired by the same people. So we need to think about what that means in terms of the natural, the relevance of some sort of notion of natural sex when the people in the group internally don't have that much in common with each other. Uh, in terms of if they're supposed to be desired, um, defined by their, you know, their relationships with people of the opposite sex, or if even if you define them anatomically, you could say in general this group of people have these features and this group of people have those features, but I mean not really <laughs> like the the development of women across ages and all of that stuff is 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 different um and you know all boobs aren't the same even if they all all boobs aren't like it's like so this idea that there's a profound commonality among women and a profound commonality among men in nature is dubious and the idea that it's relevant is dubious, but we find out it does a lot of work, right? So the gender binary does a lot of work. So uh, we need to think about how, if you presume a gender binary in nature, that does that can't be that's never going to go away, but kind of gets um, innovated through gender uh, in politics and society. But if you assume it as fund a fundamental natural fact, 
it becomes something that can't be negotiated. So all women must be treated a certain way. All men must be treated a certain way. And then you kind of negotiate at the margins. But, but really, that does a lot of work insofar as, let's say we want to make women victims, right? So right now we're watching in, in Israel that apparently a lot of Israelis, the IDF, and, and a lot of people in the United States are saying that, well, you know, Hamas raped all of these women who are Israelis. Well, and that's why we should support Hamas. Hillary Clinton just said the same thing about like how we cannot support these kind of gender crimes. That's why we need to arm the crap out of Israel. First of all, black people, if you're watching this, this is the same song. Anytime whites get nervous about people they want to exterminate and they need a reason to exterminate them, all of a sudden the people they want to exterminate become rapists. That's been the history of black life in the United States. Um, they needed to create uh, a rapist because we live in a modern world where you need reasons to exterminate people. You can't just do so out of a matter of tyranny. We need reasons to. And now the reason we go to is that they're rapists. And in order to have rapists, we need to have victims. And, and so now what it is to be a woman is to be a potential victim of sexual assault. And what it is to be a man is to protect potential victims of sexual assault. And that all is motivated by a racial politics and an ethnic politics uh, and in Israel a land grab that requires a gender binary. And that requires a gender binary. So the use and the, how is gender used is what we should look at. Um, how is gender used for a political project? Because our commitment to the gender, a, a gender binary and like understanding that all women are over here and all men are over here, our commitment to that isn't something that's necessarily, that's not a matter of like sexual desire and it's not a matter of nature. It's a matter of political functionality. And if we impute it into nature, then it becomes something that can't be politically negotiated. So we end up stuck in a politics because of a story we tell ourselves about nature. And that's where it kind of ties into Hegel's understanding of how we end up, so end up kind of stuck in a libertarian politics because of a story we tell ourselves about nature. So part of the story, part of our politics is to tell ourselves a story about nature. And so it's a political strategy to stabilize bad politics. I, uh, the natural story about gender or the natural story about personhood is a political strategy to stabilize a dubious politics. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to go into this in written form someplace else. But uh, if you appreciate what I'm doing, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com, kick in $5, $15, $50 a month, and I'll keep doing what I'm doing which I think is, you know, providing a service for the good people of these United States. And, uh, you know, I lost a lot of, I lose a lot of feminists when I talk like this because I, I mean, I, they are attached to a particular variety of womanhood, which I think is bad for racial and labor politics, which is why feminism has gone, has become more popular in the 40, last 40 years and, Black people are still poor, and and uh, and, and uh, labor uh, organized labor participation rates are in the toilet, right? So we got to think about why that's been. And I think it's not; it's more than a coincidence. It's a it's been a subterranean strategy. Um, and I will tell you, you know, every now and then I run into a, a, an old white couple where they'll say like, "Well, you know." The husband's conservative, and he's a jerk. But the wife is a Democrat, and she's really cool. And in which I case, it's, 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 I've never actually seen that really be the case. <laughs> what it usually is, the, the, the guy is a jerk, but the woman isn't really particularly hip on racial and labor politics. She just thinks she is, but she really has kind of a feckless racial and labor politics because uh, she likes spending her husband's money. And... and, and in doing so, ends up bringing the Democratic Party to the right, which I think is a problem. So, you know, maybe I can talk about that dynamic in a different place. But uh, thank you for your time, and I will talk to you at another time.